and welcome to The Matt LaGore Show. I'm your host, Matt LaGore. If there's ever a time you'd like to get in touch with me, you're more than welcome to email me at matt at mattlagore.com or you can go to my Facebook page, The Matt LaGore Show on Facebook. And just recently, I started my own YouTube channel called The Matt LaGore Show. Uh, so if uh, you don't get in touch with me, there's plenty of ways to do it and probably would mean you don't want to get in touch with me, but I hope you do. So if you have an idea for the show or you want to say something, you have a, an opinion, please send me an email. I'd love it. Or send me a message on Facebook. I'd love for you to be my friend on Facebook. I can never have too many friends. Uh, the Matt Lagore Show is about being an entrepreneur, uh, but it's not just about that. It's more really, I'd say it's more about being inspired. Uh, I kind of focus on entrepreneurism and uh, business and the inspiration that comes from it. Uh, that's just the way I have chose to go with it right now. It could change, but I like to be inspired. And I think everybody wants to be inspired in life. You know, uh, I think far too many uh, times in life you're grinding it out. And if you're grinding it out, I'd have to say that you're probably doing something wrong. Um, for example, if you're driving your car and your car makes a grinding noise, I don't think you say, hey, let me just let my car grind this out and work it out. No, you stop your car immediately. You go, oh my God, my car is about to blow up, right? And you stop and you go have it repaired. It's the same way in life. If you're grinding it out, you probably should stop, turn the camera around on yourself and see uh, maybe if you're going to make a few adjustments. Talk to somebody you trust. So don't grind it out. I don't think it's any fun. And that's what we're here to talk about. We're here to talk about, about not grinding out your life being inspired, having a good time. You know, there's so much negativity in the world today. We're bombarded with it. Uh, recently, we just, uh, the elections, uh, presidential elections uh, just finished. And uh, it really doesn't matter if you're happy that Trump's going to be president or you hate that Trump's going to be president. Most people are just angry. I, I don't understand why. Uh, one thing it could be is you're probably not focusing on yourself enough. I really think that what we need to do in life is focus on yourself, start solving your own problems. Uh, that might be inspiring to uh, someone. It might be, it'll definitely be inspiring to yourself, but you could inspire someone else uh, that would give you momentum. Now, later in the show, we're going to talk about somebody that does that, that has taken uh, their beliefs, uh, taken the things that they love, and focused on them. And uh, not only have they made themselves happy, but they're really changing the world in the process. So stick around for that. We're going to talk about that a little later in the show. Now, uh, on the Matt Lagore Show, I like to have guests. I like to have guests on my show who are up to some really good things, uh, who I find inspiring, um, who've taken their life, kind of uh, taken the bull by the horn, so to speak, you know, and they live their life the way they want to. And today, uh, it's the first time on the Matt Lagore Show I've had a family member, and uh, the family member is uh, my cousin by, by law, which, hey, it's the law, so I have we, to go we along have with it. Cousins, <laughs> is Zach Cataldo. Zach, welcome to the show. Happy to have you here today. Thank you so much for having me on the show, Matt. You're welcome. Now, Zach, you're an entrepreneur like myself. Um, uh, I'd say you're a high-end entrepreneur because right at this, at this moment, you have four businesses going on. So just in a nutshell, just tell us what they are. Sure. So uh, the first is Night Train Studios, which is a recording studio, which I started back in 1997. Um, so back before computers could even do what I wanted them to really do, I thought, this is the way to go, digital recording studio. I can afford this, right? We can all afford a PC. And so um, I used to work in big multi-million dollar recording studios like in LA and Boston. And when I saw that you could pretty much do that at home, I said, I'm doing that at home. Um, so for the first few years, we struggled a little bit because computers, you remember, they used to crash all the time. Sure, you get yeah. blue screens and stuff like that. And musicians don't tend to like <laughs> blue screens in the middle of their sessions. But um, we learned a lot from that. And so now today, most studios that you hear about are computers, right? Um, so that's what one of my businesses. Um, that morphed into a music publishing company. So music publishing is when you license music for TV, film, commercials. And so when you're around musicians all day and you're writing songs, it seemed like a natural progression to, hey, let's also write songs and get them on TV shows. So for instance, uh, the other night I was watching Vice News on HBO and I was like, wait a minute, I know that song. That's, that's one of my songs. Um, so we get our songs placed on TV all the time and that's a lot of fun. Um, our, another business that I started back in 2006 was PosterEnvy.com, which is a poster company. And that basically started from the recording studio. Had a friend who was always coming in to record Christmas albums. Um, and one Christmas, 
we were talking about business ideas, and we actually came up with the name first, which seems like an awkward, weird way to start a business, but we were just kind of shooting out, hey, wouldn't this be a fun name for a business? And when we got to Poster Envy, it kind of, we both kind of stopped for a second and said, hmm, how would that work? Um, and so that's how it started. It's basically just printing small educational posters for, for teachers. Um, and we started very small. We would probably get two or three orders a day for the first few, you know, first year or two. And that was just on eBay. Um, and then it just slowly started to grow, uh, really started to take off in 2011. Um, and last year we had over a million dollars in uh, sales. Excellent. Wow. Um, and then the fourth company right now is a YouTube channel uh, called Now You Know, uh, where we do kind of fun uh, technology and educational videos, a lot of them about Tesla. And again, that was just something we kind of did for fun uh, starting about a year ago, and then it really started to take off this summer when my son and I drove to San Francisco in our new Tesla Model X. Um, and we did it. We said, hey, wouldn't it be fun if we drove there and vlogged it every day? And we thought that would just be kind of the fun of it. Um, and we would send the video back to our editors every day um, to, to put up the next day. And while we were on the trip, we began to see a big spike in viewers. Um, and we were like, hmm, we're on to something. People, I guess, really like this kind of idea. So we've been doing it more and more, and now we're up to you know, thousands of subscribers. Um, and I think that's largely because Tesla has such a, a growing fan base of, of potential car owners. Yeah, yeah, Tesla definitely is an amazing uh, product line. I just want to ask you a question about the posters. Yeah. So do you remember back in the day where it seemed like everybody was happy with just a poster of like a kitten hanging on a branch and it said, hang in there. Yeah. And like every school, every, everybody had yeah. it. And now all of a sudden there's just like an explosion of it. So uh, do you, um, uh, is any of your success from that poster, or that, do you have anything like that with a kitten? We actually do. So we would basically, one of the things we did early on was we said, we'll do a custom poster for you. And it didn't cost any more than a regular poster. So for the same eight bucks or whatever it was, we would make you a custom poster, which is a great deal if you think about it, because we're mm. spending a lot more time on that particular poster. Um, and in the beginning, I remember a lot of people saying to me, you're crazy, that, that's costing you 30 or $40 in design time to make that poster, you're losing money. And my thought was, yeah, but you know what? There's a teacher out there who wants this poster for the classroom, and if one teacher wants that poster, there's probably thousands of others. So, I mean, there's three or four million elementary school teachers in this country. So, my thought was put the investment in for that poster. And I'll be honest, a lot of them were never wanted again. Um, but a lot of them became our best sellers. So, that is kind of the, the, the thinking I like to do, which is you've been told something by a lot of people. If they're all telling you that, my instinct is to think maybe they're all wrong. Interesting. See, that's an interesting kind of way to think is that uh, there's a theory that basically the herd f is following like one person mm -hmm. or a couple people. And th that one person could definitely be going the wrong direction. But yet everybody's going and like, well, hey, look, everybody's going that way. And I've heard that the theory is like, if you see the crowd going that way and you see a few people going that way, go with the few people. They're probably on to something. It's, yeah, especially if there are a few people that you've learned to trust from past decisions, right? Yeah. It's, it's hard not to go along with the it crowd. It really is hard. I really loved, uh, I love your show, and I love that you're talking about creative uh, spaces for people and negativity um, and trying to find a positive, something positive that you can kind of latch on to. The problem I found in life is that our best friends, our family, of course they love us, they all want the best for us, but they tend to help us in a way that actually creates a negative space instead of a positive space. Mm -hmm. so, yep. so for instance, let's say one day you came to me with an idea for, for a new product. You're like, Zach, I have this idea for a potato peeler. My first instinct to help you, Matt, would be like, I don't know, do a lot of people, I think there's already potato peelers out there, Matt. Uh, and I think your potato peeler, although it's pretty cool, I can't see how it would compete with the big companies out there. And so I think I'm helping you. I think I'm giving you some great advice that maybe this is, you know, you haven't thought this through or whatever. But what I've actually just done there is I probably just lowered your self-confidence and made you doubt yourself. Mm -hmm. And so are you going to want to think about that idea again? Maybe not. Maybe you're like, well, Zach, who I respect and trust, just said that this is probably not a great idea. So I'll put that in the back burner. Yeah. yeah. Instead of if I said to you, wow, potato peeler? Awesome. Tell me more about this potato peeler. Mm -hmm. And then we just start brainstorming and talking and whatever, um, it may never go anywhere, but at least then it had a chance to, as that little seedling would have, a little chance to sprout 
and maybe catch hold. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I was talking to a friend of mine. He uh, he 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 has a business on Amazon, sells products, and he said one of the things like he has massive success right now. And I was like, well, how did you get to the massive success? Like, I mean, you must have just come up with an idea and just been like, bang, hit it out of the park, right? Because that's what we think success is, exactly. right? And he goes, no, actually, he goes, it was like, I just trudged along. He goes, I trudged along day by day, little by little. And he goes, that's success. He goes, success is the everyday action that you take that turns into many actions. And he goes, then sometimes, he goes, it hits and it just takes off like a, like a rocket sled or something. He goes, but you got to put in the, 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 uh, just the monotonous stuff. Yes. And he goes, that's where the success is. So I think too many people think that they will, if, if the idea is a good idea, it will be successful within days or weeks. Mm -hmm. um, I see this with musicians all the time. Uh, they put out a CD and they think, this is it. This yeah. is going to be a hit. Um, it, in my mind, from what I've learned with my businesses, and this could be different for others, but I generally set a five-year time frame for a business to become even moderately successful. And if you set a time frame of that long, then in the first few weeks or months when things aren't exploding, you won't just give up on it because you'll know, oh, I'm on a five-year glide path, so I'm down here, and of course I haven't reached here yet. Because um, you're completely right. It takes day in, day out, refining, trying, experimenting, and also it takes a long time before ideas catch with other people. So even if your potato peeler is the best potato peeler in the world, it's going to take time before it spreads. Mm -hmm. And we all kind of think, oh, I'll put it on Facebook or I'll put it on Amazon and it, it'll just take off. Well, it's got to get into their algorithms. So when we started our businesses on Amazon, it took about five months before we even began to see any kind of liftoff. And so if we had been looking for liftoff in a few weeks, we would have just gone, oh, well, this, this isn't working. It takes a while before algorithms and so forth take hold. So uh, when you first started your poster business, PosterEnvy.com, if you want to check out PosterEnvy.com, uh, you'll see some fantastic uh, posters, some funny posters, and maybe you'll even come up with a great idea yourself and you can share it with Zach. So Zach, when you first started the PosterEnvy.com, um, what would you say uh, your, your uh, monthly sales were in the first year of it? Yeah, I think our, our daily sales were, you know, two. And when we'd have four, we would just jump up and down, call each other on the phone. Uh, and so uh, it was, I'm thinking it was probably in the, you know, we probably made uh, $6,000 the first year. Six, and, six large. Nice. And the big yeah. thing about companies for me that I've learned is that you want to try and keep your margins as high as possible. Yeah. Doesn't mean everyone has to do it this way. There's plenty of businesses out there where you have a low margin, but you have lots of sales. But for me... Having a high margin means that I don't have to, if every poster I sell I'm actually making money on, then at the end of the day, I'm profitable. So if I sold two posters today, I actually made money. Mm -hmm. um, if you've set up a business where you had to sell at least 100 today to make a profit because you had to cover the cost of your, your um, renting a place and you have some employees and you have heat, and then there's pressure from day one, right? You open your business, you have a grand opening, and then every day you've got to have X amount of sales. That's a lot of pressure, and a lot of businesses fail just for that very reason, that they've set up such a large threshold from day one that they can't maintain it. So one of my businesses that failed years ago, I set up a, a newspaper back in 1994. What was it called? It was called the Boston Signal. Okay, yep. Um, 10,000 issues a week. Um, we got, before we started, we had salesmen, and we had, you know, ad people, and we had contributors, and we had everything all okay, laid so out. Okay, so let's just go back on this. That was interesting. Yeah. So here you go. How did you come up with an idea for a newspaper? I, uh, me and my cousin, uh, we, I was living out in California at the time, and I, there were some local newspapers out there, and I thought, this is great. I would love to be in control of a newspaper. Advertise. Who wouldn't want to control right. a newspaper yeah. empire, right? Be a mogul, right. like uh, just Citizen Kane, right? right. And this yeah. is before the internet was really a <laughs> big thing, so a newspaper seemed like a very great idea. Um, and so when I got back to Boston, we started it up. Uh, we printed out our 10,000 copies, we distributed them, and we thought... Is this, now when you distribute them, the first 10,000 free? Free, Okay. Right. And um, so what went into it, uh, the idea, how many people did you, would you say you had to get involved before you printed anything just to come up with the, the process? Yeah, we had to find a contributor. So we needed a sports guy, we needed a weather guy, we needed a funny person, we needed a news guy. So we would go around and find students at Harvard and so forth to be our writers. And if you're giving out a free newspaper, guess how much you can pay for your con contributions? Not much. Mm -hmm. So um, we, that was a big part of it, was 
to find a base of you needed content every week. Mm -hmm. um, and so some of our big things I think at the time were, you know, we'll, we'll have the movie times and we'll have the movie reviews and, you know, things like that. Um, and so, yeah, that was a, a lot of work every week to make sure that you had the content to lay out the newspaper, which we were doing digitally, you know, on, on software, yeah. imagine that. Um, and then you, you put out this newspaper um, and crickets, right? Because, <laughs> you know, what do you, when you find a rolled up newspaper on your front door, you know, what are you going to do with it, right? What we didn't realize at the time was to get advertisers, you need to have put out this newspaper dozens of times before Matt Lagore is going to pick up the newspaper and go, oh, wow, I'm going to do something with this. Um, and so after the fourth uh, issue came out, after about a month, we were out of money and, we, and advertisers were not flocking to our door and mm -hmm. we were the failure that I was talking about. And all, basically, not that it was a bad newspaper or a bad idea, we didn't have either the funding to keep it going for long enough or a sustainable method. Looking back, what should we have done? Maybe we should have put it out in a smaller area first, or mm -hmm. we should have thought of some way to make it sustainable from day one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so when you're thinking of your ideas, if you can think about sustainability from, an, from the onset, that is a very important concept. And it's, it's important to try and find a way to do that. The beauty of it now is with the internet, I could have put out that, that newspaper digitally for no money. Right, mm -hmm. and that's what YouTube is, for instance. So with now, you know, I can make a video for very low cost. After I've paid for a few things like cameras and some software, I can make a video. And if it's a clunker and no one's going to watch it, it didn't really cost me any more than making a video that turns out to be, you know, highly watched. So for instance, we put out a video a few weeks ago that was uh, how to install a Tesla wall charger. Yeah, just something we were doing anyway. We shot it, put it up. And now we've had like 50,000 views. It's one of our most watched videos. I couldn't have predicted that. Mm -hmm. I've kind of learned long ago to stop predicting those yeah. kind of things. Yeah. Because if I tried to predict it, uh, I would have been wrong. You also get hung up. I think when you think you have a great idea, you get hung up on it and you stop being creative yes. and you get tunnel vision yep. and you're not seeing reality and you're probably not even listening to people anymore. So yes. that's, a great, that's a great point. Uh, don't try and predict it. If you if you got something good and you like it, run with it as far as you can. Yes. And see what happens. Yes. And try and you know throw as many things at the wall as you can. If your business allows you to say it's a, a restaurant or a muffin shop, you know don't just make blueberry muffins. Make keep coming out with new muffins every week. But everybody loves blueberry muffins. Actually. They do. <laughs> everybody. So I really want to focus on blueberry. We should start with blueberry. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, uh, but I'm gonna, <laughs> only going to do blueberry. I mean that's the biggest biggest margin right there I think is blueberry so I'm just gonna thanks but I'm just gonna go blueberry. right there you go and how long before I'm out of business pretty quickly right right, right? that's what happens though you get too focused on that right. you think you have a good idea um, because you think you know you know everyone else right and right. the thing is no one's ever experienced a blueberry kale muffin let's say so until you try it and put it out there who knows if it's gonna do well and plus a lot of businesses do this they put out their blueberry kale muffin because someone suggested it they put it out for a week no one buys it and they go, see, you were wrong. Nobody wants a blueberry kale muffin. Well, they didn't try it for long enough, probably, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, to make sure that they had really saturated the market first. Yeah, yeah. So staying power, too. Uh, blueberry kale sounds terrible. <laughs> could but, be. But it, but it could be good. If you buy one, I'll have some of it. I'll try it. So, so um, now, you're not, just, uh, you're, you're not just a guy who um, is uh, uh, technically savvy. Uh, you've, uh, you were telling me before... Uh, you worked in a hardware store when you were five years old. Uh, you grew up in a construction family, hammers and nails, right? It yep. doesn't get any more basic than that. Nope. You, uh, you're, a, you're, a, uh, you're a general contractor, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, but here you are, you own a recording studio, you make posters, and um, uh, you, what, what else was it? Recording studio, posters? Yeah, uh, music uh, publishing. Music publishing. Yep. And now you have your YouTube channel now you know, so you've kind of gone into the, uh, uh, the television world, so to speak, right. you know. Um, now this, the, the now you know, I really love it. I think it's Thank awesome. You, uh, you do the, these, uh, these um, videos and you're kind of mostly focusing on Tesla, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, at this point in time. Uh, because uh, the person I was talking about in the introduction about somebody who has taken like their life's uh, beliefs, their dreams, uh, their, their interests, uh, is Elon Musk. Yep. Now, I, I listened to his, uh, his biography, and since he was a kid, he's been um, kind of uh, obsessing about space, electric cars, and solar power. 
And he was laughed at. Uh, ridiculed, bullied, bullied, uh, it, it condemned. Like this is never going to work. Yep. And now here he is. He's now he's on that. He he already went through the rough stuff. Now he's ab about to change the world. I mean, let's yeah. be honest. He, he already has changing. changed the world. Yeah. And he's inspired people like me. Now I thought I knew a lot about Elon Musk till I met you, <laughs> and you know so much more, which is, I, I, which is which is so interesting to me because now I can learn more. But He's really had an impact on you. Huge impact. And what would you say the biggest impact he's had on you? I mean, back when I was a, a teenager, I wanted an electric car. They were just, this is 1986, GM was coming out with their EV1. Yeah. And I thought, this is it. This is so great. In a couple of years, I'll have that. And then if, if anyone's seen those movies, like what happened to the electric car, oh, yeah, seen it. Uh, GM <laughs> just basically scrapped them and mushed them down. And, and they were gone for most of our lifetime, right? There was no more talk of electric cars. And so in the back of my brain for decades, I've been like waiting for an electric car. And so in 2013, when I heard about this Model X, which would be an all-wheel drive SUV electric car with a range of 250 miles, I thought, this is perfect. It'll handle New England weather. It'll do everything I need for my family. It seats seven. Awesome. It's expensive. Uh, so I started saving. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was supposed to come out the next year. It didn't uh, because it has falcon wing doors and they are very complicated. And the company that was supposed to design them in Switzerland couldn't do it. So what did Elon do? He took that in-house and they designed it themselves. So there's been, there were some delays and a lot of people are like, oh, see, he can't do it. Um, but lo and behold, 2016 rolls around. There's my car. Um, and I was just so excited because this was, A, my first new car ever. Um, and it was the electric car that I dreamed of. And it's inspired me because there's been so many naysayers. As, as Elon has come up with this idea back in the early 2000s of an electric car company, everyone, and we're talking everyone, if you go back and watch the videos of the, of the news people and so forth, everyone said, it's not going to work. It, if it, it, at most, it'll be a rich person's fast car for people like George Clooney to drive, but yeah. that'll be the end of it. And now fast forward to today, we see that the Model 3 is going to come out next year, which is a $35,000 affordable car uh, for the masses. And still, even up to, to, to today, people are saying, well, he can't do it. He can't mass produce this car at that cost. Um, at every turn, they've said, he can't have a solar company. He can't merge that solar company with his electric car company. He can't make battery packs that store all the, all the energy for your house. He can't do this. He can't do that. And at each step, he's doing it. Then, not to mention a SpaceX company where he puts rockets into the, into the atmosphere, in, in, into the orbit, and then lands them back down on a remote drone ship. Like Things that, if we talked about just a few years ago, would be just science fiction. Mm -hmm. um, all because not only is he a genius, I mean, that, this is stuff, you know, I can't ever hope to be as smart, but he had a vision and he had a confidence in himself. And when everyone would say you can't do it, he would just go and do it. So with, his, with SpaceX, he found a few other engineers. They founded SpaceX with about 17 people. Um, he didn't know how to make a rocket. He didn't, wasn't born a rocket scientist. He just read a lot of books. Yeah. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. And when people told him he couldn't do it, found a way to do it. Um, and he keeps doing that. And that's, to me, so inspirational because our whole life we've been told certain things that you can't do. And they always point to the fact that it hasn't been done as their argument for why you can't do it. Well, if, if you could do it, it would have been done. Here he's coming along saying, yeah, I can do it. It hasn't been done, but we're going to do it. To the point now where we're talking about colonizing Mars. Yeah. Like things that just sound like what crazy people will be talking about. Just, mm -hmm. you know, and he's actually starting to do it to the point where people are going, wow, I guess we can do that. Yeah. Yeah, that's the thing. Like, he, there's a guy who focused on his problems, all right, so to speak, his issues, his dreams. Um, I don't think he spent a lot of time on Facebook uh, sending out mean messages to people. Uh, you know, not that Facebook was around, but you know, you get my point. Right. All right, he focused on what he wanted to do. Uh, and then he, his vision... Uh, inspired people. Now he's done a lot of things, you know, he, PayPal and everything came up with that idea. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's worked, he's very close with his brother. Right. And the two of them kind of fed off each other, mm -hmm. but their energy inspired people around them 
to the point now where he's got three massive companies all doing good. I put a little thing up on Facebook that maybe Elon Musk is just a kind alien that's come <laughs> down to save us from ourselves. And he's just doing it step by step, almost, almost silently. And, and, and you know, it's not... But for something of this magnitude... No, you're right. I mean, they, they don't advertise. They don't I, advertise. I've heard so many people say, please just run one Super Bowl ad to let the world know about your car. Because as much as I know about it and you know about it, uh, when you drive up in a Tesla and, and, and people are like, wait, that was so silent. What is that car? And you're like, oh, it's an electric car. And you tell them a few things about it. They go, well, why haven't I, why haven't I heard about this? And it's like, because they're not GM. They don't have a budget for, for advertising. Yeah. And so what, what GM spends on advertising they spend on the car. Yeah, right. They put it back into the car. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, that movie you mentioned, Who Killed the Electric Car? I watched that. That's probably what? Is it almost 10 years old now? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's Some, quite, somewhere around right. there. I found it so disheartening watching like the first three quarters of it mm -hmm. because uh, basically, you know, they changed regulation and they just made massive cars. The Hummer came out mm -hmm. and GM was like, hey, you know what? Let's get rid of this thing. Right. And they took them all back and crushed them. By the way, Francis Ford Coppola, the movie director, mm -hmm. he still has his. his he, oh, he saved He, he wouldn't EV? give it back. He, he hid great. it. And when they came to look for it, he wouldn't tell them where it That's was. Great. So he still has it. That's he great. has it in his garage. That's uh, right. Or he has got a car collection. Right, you know? right. So he still has his. But anyway... But at the end of it, at the end of that, if anybody wants to watch it, who, who killed the electric car? It's interesting. It's kind of almost irrelevant at this point. Right. But they talk about Tesla. Mm -hmm. And they had the Tesla Roadster that mm -hmm. had like 300-mile range. Mm -hmm. And they talked about um, solar shingles. Mm -hmm. like, oh, man, that's out of this world. Right. No that's a crazy way, idea. You know? But now it's all reality. You yeah, know, the, the, the movie route. left you with a little bit of hope, you know, at the end mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, that the, the fact that... You know, now we're seeing all this, and it's like happening like at a rapid pace. Now you have solar on your house, right? Yeah. Uh, and you've got to be you're you're, you're an, an early ad adapter. Uh, how long have you had them on your house? Since 2013. Right. So three years, going on four years. Um, I've actually found so. I mean, there's eight levels of adoption uh, that, yeah. that scientists have come up with, right? Mm -hmm. I'm actually at level three usually when I look at myself. Um, so some people are the first person yeah. for the newest product, right? They're level mm -hmm. one, um, and then there's maybe your great grandmother who's level eight, you know, the last person to get anything. <laughs> the person right? with the rotary phone, <laughs> right? right? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so, yeah. So there's all these kind of levels, and it's an interesting thing to just kind of figure out where you are on on the, the spectrum is to kind of figure out, you know, am I an early adopter? And I'm not. So I mean, 2013. There's been people for decades before me with solar. Um, and that is a big part of this, which is when your neighbor gets solar, then you go, oh, wait a minute, Matt got solar. And then, then you talk to Matt and mm -hmm. you say, so your roof didn't cave in? And so the sky didn't fall when you got solar? And I think humans have to realize that about ourselves. We are a very slow moving, evolving people. And we need social interaction to feel comfortable with technology. So mm -hmm. when I see you with a smartphone 10 years ago, I go, Matt, what's that? And then you go, oh, it's a smartphone. It's awesome. You're going to have one. And, I'm gonna, and what did you hear the first time? You probably heard a lot of your friends say, I'm never going to have a smartphone. That's really expensive. And I, it looks too, I don't need that. I have a flip phone. It works great. Yeah. Right? And then what? A year later, everyone had one. Yeah. Um, we are social creatures, so when we see each other with a smartphone, the reason why they can spread so quickly is we see them every day. Yeah. Solar is a little slower because you have to look up at people's roofs and you have to see it, but same thing, you're seeing it, right? And that's what's going to happen with electric cars, is that you're going to start seeing more and more of them on the road as you're in traffic and you see this guy next to you who isn't even steering because mm -hmm. his car is driving for him. You're going to go, wait, what? what? And that's how you're going to discover it. Um, but that's the point for me about the media that I love about YouTube. So YouTube, we're bypassing, we're not on NBC right now. Mm -hmm. Whatever you want to broadcast, you are broadcasting. Mm -hmm. And whoever wants to watch it can watch it. That's amazing if you think about it. Because yeah. going back to when we were kids, there's three channels. Mm -hmm. And what was on them was controlled. And we saw what we, that's all we could see. Yeah. Now you turn on YouTube, you can follow different people that you like and learn about what's going on in the world, not from the big media outlets. Yeah. And that's just a huge, huge change. Jesse, how are we doing for time? Uh, 41 seconds. All right. 40, <laughs> wow, we nailed it. <laughs> so um, the, the, I want to just uh, finish the show with, uh, with this, is that, you know, focus on yourself, trust yourself, uh, give yourself some time 
uh, if you start something. As Zach said, you know, five-year window. Five years goes by fast. You know, we were talking about our kids earlier, how fast yeah. they grow up. Anybody who has kids knows exactly what I'm talking about. Time goes by fast. So give yourself the time. Believe in yourself. If you see the crowd going to the left, I suggest going to the right. I also suggest if you want a poster, go to posterenvy.com. Check it out. Uh, Zach's got some uh, great ideas. Uh, if you want to check out Zach's uh, YouTube channel, Now You Know, you can find out so many things about Tesla, which is uh, really amazing in itself. And then there's Solar City and SpaceX. You will be mesmerized. If you're any kind of technical person, you'll, you'll really love it. Uh, Zach, I want to thank you for being on the show. Uh, and, uh, j and, it's, and not because the law has told me that you're now part of my family, but I really enjoyed having you here. Uh, I'd love to have you on again. In the future, we can talk maybe more a little bit about Elon, see what he's up to then. I Great. Up for it. Who knows what he'll be up to then, right? Yeah, you never we know. Might be, this might be broadcasting from Mars next time. We, we never know. know. <laughs> Jesse, uh, your son wants to go to Mars, right? He does. Okay, well, I'm looking forward to seeing you on <laughs> Mars in the future. All right, well, I want to thank you for watching The Matt Lagore Show, uh, and we'll see you in the next episode.